Hello, we are here with another episode of Mark and Mark, Shine and Miller. And Mark Shine, we are heavy into some serious basketball. And I got your microphone running by putting the new battery in it, and I turned the monitor on. I'm into tech stuff, too. He can too. do it all. He officiates, he calls the games, he used to coach, he does it. All right, well, he I paints. have the... Yes, yeah, right. That's right. Hey, review games. Review you get games. A start. All right, Shawnee I got and Van Shawnee and Van Wert. Okay, you're coming into this game. Who are you picking? Shawnee and Van Wert. Well, let's look at it this way. Shawnee's on a nine-game win streak. During that time period, they're just outscoring people. Johnny Caprella had 59 points in the two previous games. Van Wert comes in at three and seven. They had a three-point loss to Marion Local, but before that, they had 19-point loss to OG, 38-point loss to Carroll, 16-point loss to St. Mary's. So who are you picking? Well, it's tied at 13 at the end of the first quarter. Van Wert's up one at the end of at halftime. The third quarter is tied, and then Van Wert, the team that's supposed to not have enough depth to play 32 full minutes, they win the fourth quarter 17-14 and win the basketball game 58-55 with the Shawnee Indians. Jacob Kelly had 23 points. Nate Place had 22. They held Caprella to just nine points. Nice win for Van Wert. They come back on Saturday night. Place and Bagley both go over 20 points. They beat Bryan 64-40. Good weekend for the Cougars. Shawnee bounces back on Saturday night. Caprella had 40, wow. including three three-point field goals, and they beat Wayne Trey 78-69. So a split weekend for the Shawnee Indians. All right, you and I last Friday night were at the field house where Wapak gave Elida its first loss, 50-47. Wapak was down seven points, 39-32 in the fourth, and then went on a 10-0 run. Aaron Good, especially down the stretch, was good. Had 11 points in the fourth quarter, led him with 20. Adam Scott had 12 points, five rebounds. Gage Schenk had a great night of defense guarding Daniel Unruh. Dante Johnson led Elida with 12 points and six rebounds. Unruh and Isaac McAdams each had 11. Both teams now are two and one, still chasing OG at 4-0. Everybody likes to play defense, right? Defense wins championships? Well, okay. Coldwater Cavaliers, they come in averaging 72 points a game in January. Marcus Bruns was averaging 21.7 in January. Cole Frilling, 14.7. They had three other guys that have been in double figures at least once in the month of January. And then they run into the Delphi St. John's Blue Jays, held them to 46 in regulation. Cole Frilling had uh, 17 points, but Bruns only nine. Jared Worst came through for D DSJ with 17, including three three-point field goals. Richard Kakuza had 11, and DSJ wins in overtime over Coldwater, 53-50. This is the third win this year in extra time for DSJ that had already beaten Ottoville and Lima Central Catholic in overtime. And the real key mark, 1,500 wins in 100 years of Delphi St. John's basketball. That averages out to, my math says, 15 wins a year over 100 years. That is a lot of tradition. Congratulations right on that one. Hey, Saturday night we went to the Supreme Court and we saw a really good game. Lima uh, Senior High up there at Ottawa Glendorf to play the Titans. It was 34-34 at halftime. 76-73 with 21 seconds to go. Lima Senior High was down three. Brian Miller had a great night. All around the floor had 27 points. Jermaine Daniel had 20. Greg Johnson had 11 for Ottawa Glendorf. Jay Kaufman led everybody, 32 points and did everything a guy could do. Bryce Schrader, really hot, made some big plays, 18 points. Owen Hegel, extreme quickness at the point guard, had 16 points. This was really yeah. a well-played game. Not very many turnovers, hardly any free throws in the first half. And for a Saturday night game, when you think they might be lacking a little bit in the energy category, not so. They were up right. and down the floor. This was really, really a fun game to watch. It was a really, really good basketball game. We're going to feature some highlights of Jay Kaufman a little bit later on. Would you say he's back? Yeah, he's yeah, back. He's, he's back. Healthy. He is yeah. back in a major way. All right. Well, how about Minster and Fort Laramie? A really nice non-conference matchup. Fort Laramie came in at 13-0. They were 6-0 in the SCAL. They'd beaten Botkins by 40 the night before, and not a single Botkins player got into double figures against Fort Laramie. They've been defending very, very well. Minster came in at 8-2. They had beaten New Bremen by five the night before. This is a game that goes into overtime. And what happens? Well, we're going to talk about this as we go through it because uh, Fort Laramie is up one. Okay, Twice, Minster had to foul to get the both ball back. Braun made one free throw each time, so now Minster is down three. They got the ball back under five seconds, and timeout. What does Fort Laramie try? Do you foul? Do you not foul? You know that whole issue? Well, mm -hmm. Fort Laramie chooses to foul with 2.7 seconds left in the game. They send Kettner to the free throw line. He makes the first. He tries to miss the second. Hits the backboard two hards and actually goes into the basket. 
and Fort Laramie has a 52-51 win over Minster. That was a really, really good basketball game. Braun had 23, Siegel 17 and 12 uh, for uh, the Fort Laramie Redskins. Schultz had uh, 15, Kettner had nine points, four boards, five assists, four steals. A good basketball game between two really good teams. Hey, last Saturday afternoon, we had the game of the week in girls basketball in the state. We had number one and number three. Ottoville, number three, this is in Division Four. went down to Minster, who was ranked number one. Ottoville was up 45-38 with five minutes to go. And everybody thought, oh, Minster's just about ready to lose their second. Ottoville's going to keep that undefeated record. For Ottoville, Casey Knippen, 20 points, a lefty that plays out front. Man, she is really a good ball handler. Cassandra Kemper had 17 points, and with the loss now, they are 15-1. and one. Courtney Pringer, she's a junior, committed to Xavier, and she never do anything single-handedly in basketball, but she was big down the stretch to get them to come back. Hey, how about Ben Reif, huh? Oh, yeah. She's gonna, he's going to like to go to his <laughs> alma mater, Xavier, and watch yep. Courtney. She is really, really good. She had 11 of 22, her 22 in the fourth quarter. And then just for good measure, they got a freshman named Ivy Wolf. She had 15 points, and they are 14-1. and one. And this was a game where both coaches had complete control. The players were in complete control. This was ultimate respect for each other's programs. This is what high school basketball was all about. I was proud to be a part of it. And, and you know, it, it doesn't want to sound sexist, but you said something to me that is kind of the ultimate compliment you can give a girl, Pringer. She plays like a guy. She shoots like a boy. She shoots like she a boy. She's at wrist, man. She's really And, and when you say that, that's not meant to be disparaging. That, no. That's a compliment for, for her. Yes, sir. How about that? All right. Well, that's the, the pre, uh, review games. Now we're going to tell you about some of the individual stat stuffers. And, Mark, you got the first All guy. right. Well, Crestview's Paige Motika. Uh, she was, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead of myself on the schedule. Having, okay, Ottoville's Josh Turbin, the freshman up there at Ottoville. He's got 26 points and three made three, three point field goals in a win over Miller City. That was a 78 62 win for Ottoville. They got a good year going. The freshman can really play. Luke Earhart from Kaleida had 21 points, including two threes in a 58 49 win over Grove. He's only played in four games this year and he scored 10, 15, 8, and now 21. Looks like they're going to get a little boost on the scoring from Luke. Yeah, Kaleida was already 11 2. You add that to the mix. How about that? How about Miller City's Noah Otto? We've seen him before as one of the best shooters in the area. Noah Otto had 23, including five made three point field goals in that loss to Ottoville. Came back with 19 all in the first half and made three three point field goals in a 65 45 win over Temple Christian. Miller City's got a scorer there to go with Coleman. Well, here's a name you don't hear very often, Brody Bowman from Temple. <laughs> Actually, we tell you his name almost every week, but this week especially had 34 points and seven threes in their win over Riverside. They came back and they lost to Miller City, but Brody had another 16. All right, now we got a couple of teams that had big upset wins. Continental and Caleb Olds. Continental had not won a basketball game this year. Caleb Olds had 26 points, had four made three-point field goals. First win of the year for Pirates as they beat Macomb 57-51. Congratulations getting off the snide there. And Waynesfield, yep. big upset over league favorite Elgin. They win that game 53-43, and Tanner Hurley had 23 points. That is a huge win. That's a huge win. Waynesfield goes. I, I looked at that. It came across the WSN app. I went, oh, we put the score on backwards. <laughs> no, we didn't. Congratulations, <laughs> Waynesfield. All right, we got several bright spots, yes, and it starts off with what OHSAA and Jerry Snodgrass has started the last few years, and that's Military Appreciation Night. Mark, we had a good time. Yeah, we did. We have our uh, Military Appreciation Tie Nights on. You got your Lady Liberty tie on here. I got my Uncle Sam tie on, and the crowd got into it as well from both schools, uh, Elida, and there are lots of good things happened across the state. I know Jerry's got a Twitter account, and he put lots of pictures and lots of events on that, that he had that particular. Here we are with the Elida students. Some of them were involved in the Military Night, too, and and we decided to go mug with the crowd a little bit. We really appreciate our military folks, and we appreciate the people who took time to support them. Lots of different activities for military appreciation night around the state. That was great. All right, we had several milestones in the last week. Let's go over a few of them. Crestview's Paige Motika. Her had 29 points. That puts her over 1,000 in a 77-32 win over Ada. She also, just for good measure, had four <laughs> rebounds and four assists. But... How about that name at Crestview Motika? How about that? Yeah, how about Justin Arms? Now, we've been tracking this for a little while. He needed six points to become the all-time career scoring leader in the MAC. Well, he had 38 of them. <laughs> barely made it. Yeah, just barely made it. 38 of them. Then also had time for 10 rebounds. How do you score 38 points and also have 10 assists? Did he that night as they defeated Fort Recovery 73-46. He is the number one scorer now in MAC history, passing fellow MAC uh, for, for sales guy Kyle Gale. 
And he set that record back in 2004. Aaron's now has 1,776 points in his high school career, and we're only halfway through his senior oh, years. Oh, boy. How about a coaching milestone? Arlington coach Jason Vermillion got 300 wins and only 144 losses, by the way, in a 58-47 win over Liberty Benton. He came back the next night and got number 301 against Spencerville. Ivan Barry, a player, had 23 against Liberty Benton and 11 against Spencerville. We've been following a little bit of things that have been happening at Ohio Northern. Amy Bullimore became the career scoring for the ladies at Ohio Northern. She now has 1,255 points. Morgan Dumball had the previous record at 1,242. And then you pointed out to me today, Ryan Bruns is now the career leader in block shots at Ohio Northern. He has 172. He's also setting at 985 points, and he will join that 1,000-point mm -hmm. club very quickly. Pretty good when you can block shots uh, on the defensive end and score it on the offensive end. A couple more coaches, this time in baseball. The Ohio High School baseball coaches inducted two local guys into their Hall of Fame. Minster's coach Mike Wiss and Kaleida's Jim McBride go into the Hall of Fame. Of course, Mike Wiss is coaching that girls team that we just talked about a minute ago, but congratulations to those two guys. If you can coach, you can coach. You can coach. Doesn't matter what team, That's right. what sport, right? It's about teaching and motivation, right? There you go. All right. You got a rule of the week this we time. We do. Our rule of the week, and this came because I was actually asked, hey, how do the officials decide when they're going to stop play because somebody's hurt? And it's kind of an interesting thing. It's actually in three, two different places in the rule book, plus a thing for the National High School Federation. So the rule book says, Susie Snowflake rolls her ankle. What do we do? Well, okay, if the ball becomes dead, that means somebody throws it out of bounds or a team scores, we stop play, we take care of Susie's ankle. When the uh, other team, the team with the basketball, stops trying to score, then you can stop play as well. In other words, they back the ball out to midcourt. They're not trying to actively score. You can stop play. And, of course, when the offensive team gives up the ball and now Susie's team gets possession of the basketball, then you stop play as well. So three situations. There is one more that says to protect an injured player. So if Susie rolls her ankle and she's laying under the basket, everybody's jumping for rebounds, then you can stop it. And I think everybody stops it if you think it's a head injury, no matter what the situation is, because that's so serious right there. Now, when can Susie come back in the game? Well, if she doesn't need medical attention, then she can continue to play. But if a coach comes off the bench or the trainer comes off the bench, she has to set till the ball becomes alive, the clock stops, and then the ball stops again. The clock stops again. Or if her team calls timeout and she's healthy enough to play after the timeout, then she can return to play immediately. The same thing, the same rule applies to blood on a player or on a uniform. You get blood on you, you get it on your uniform. If you self-detect it, most officials will give you time to wipe it off if you can. If not, the same rule applies, and the same rule applies if a, a official catches it. You have to go and set out until the clock starts and then stops again before you can return. And everybody's got concussions on the mind right now. We've all dealt with that. The concussion rule simply says if you think you have a concussion, you are not to play again until you are approved by medical personnel. Not to coach, not mom up in the stands, but until medical personnel approve you. And the National Federation on High School Athletics says if you get a concussion or you are suspected of having one, you are done for today. Good and, rule. And good rule, absolutely. Yeah. Protection. All right, thanks, Coach Shine. We always like to follow our local guys when they go on to play in college, and we got a couple of good ones to share with you tonight. I'll start off. Ryan Mike Sell from St. Henry, now at the University of Dayton. Hey, in his senior year in 2015, his team was 20 and 2 in the regular season. They were the MAC champs. He was the MAC Player of the Year. First team, Division III All Ohio, averaged 22.8 points, 11 rebounds, four assists, and four blocks per game. He is number six all-time in max scoring. You know, we talked about Arns a little while ago, number one now. Well, he's number six, 1,540 points. Then he goes to the University of Dayton. He's number 33 down there, and he's grown up a little bit. He's 6'7", 215 pounds as a junior. As a sophomore, he played in all 32 games and started 24 of them. Averaged 5.7 points a game and four rebounds. They were 24 and eight. They won the Atlantic 10 Conference at 15 and three and went to their fourth straight NCAA tournament. But last summer, he had a couple of surgeries to, cor to correct some injuries to his hips. It's a six-month minimum recovery, and so he is redshirted this year, not part of uh, the active roster, still on the roster, still there, just not playing this season. He'll come back next year and have two more years to play, and 
he'll be a good player for them to have around for two years. Ryan Mikesell. Similar player to, to Ryan Mikesell is Kyle Arns, who played at Versailles and now is at Michigan State University. And while he was at Versailles, they were 23-6 and six his sophomore year, and they uh, went on to the state championship game where they were became runners-up in the state that year. Mark, they were 23-6. and six. They were 5-4 and four in the MAC. That's how good that conference was that year. So they had one non-conference loss and one loss in the state championship game. His junior year, he played just six games before having a serious leg injury. But his senior year, he came back at Versailles. He was the D3 first-team All-Ohio player. He averaged 30 points a game, 8.3 rebounds, 3.4 assists as they went to the regionals that year. He is now fifth in the MAC in scoring career-wise with 1,000. 666 points. Then off to Michigan State University, played in 26 games as a freshman. As a sophomore, played in 34 games, averaging two and a half points a game and 1.1 rebounding rebounds per game. He was also all Mac academic as a sophomore, majoring in advertising. And Coach uh, Tom Izzo at Michigan State just announced he has had a leg injury to a lower part of his body all year long, and they have decided he will not play the rest of this year and will be redshirted. And much like you did a moment ago with Mike Sell, he have two years to come back and play. He might be well be playing against his brother for two years. He's committed oh to Ohio boy. State University. Mom and Dad would love that. Yes, they would. All right. Well, last week before our game, uh, Mark got in the truck and did an interview with uh, – producer, director, and we called him Grand Poobah that night because he does everything around here. But we're going to uh, give you a look at that interview right now, give you a little insight into what Ben goes through on a weekly basis here at the station. Thanks, Mark. We're here in truck two. This is Ben Reif, our producer, director, Grand Poobah of everything that goes on with WOSN Sports. Ben, we get a lot of questions when we go out, and biggest one is, how do you decide which games get on the air? So take us through that process. Well, it's a very complex mathematical formula that we <laughs> none of that's true. Um, it, it really is a bunch of us getting together in a room and going, okay, who do we think is going to be good this year? We try, we try and remember to the previous season. This usually happens in about October for basketball season. Trying to think back to the previous season and go, you know, who was seniors, who who was good, who's going to be moving up. Um, you know, consider coaching changes and 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 all the possibilities, uh, and then yeah, you know, look at the master schedule that usually you've devised for us and come up with a, a big composite schedule and go through all of those and go, we think these are the ones that will be good. Um, sales does play a little bit of a, of a, of a factor into that. Um, you know, we're a nonprofit, uh, which means we don't make any money, but we don't want to lose too much money. Uh, and so uh, that is a, a necessary consideration, uh, but certainly not the only consideration. Now, now, we're here in truck two tonight, and we've got truck one out. You've got a couple of multi-cams. Yep. Part of your decision is facilities and where you can take those things. I, absolutely. Truck one is, is our older, larger truck. Uh, there's a handful of, of schools that can host it easily. Uh, there's a, another number that can host it not so easily. <laughs> um, and then there's you know, some that just outright can't host truck one. Uh, whereas truck two, uh, this is a smaller, I like to say a little leaner and meaner truck. Uh, and uh, it's able to fit into some places that uh, the truck one wouldn't be able to fit into. Uh, and then our multicam crews can can literally go anywhere. Uh, when we pair them up with a, one of our radio partners, uh, the requirement is literally just three feet of space somewhere in the gym, and so we can uh, fit them into the, the absolute tightest of, of tight spots. So it gives us a lot of flexibility in, in what places we're able to go and make sure that, uh, that if there's a game we want to do, uh, that we can get there and, and do it even when they say, oh, gosh, we just don't think we have any room for you. I go, well, what if I offer you this? Yeah, it gives me some, <laughs> some uh, I don't want to say bargaining, but, but, but flexibility, certainly, uh, to be able to, to get the games that, that matter. Okay, now we're in truck two, and there's all this wonderful equipment behind us. Sometimes, sometimes when it works, it's wonderful. <laughs> okay, <laughs> well, how many guys you're going to produce, how many you're going to direct, how many mm -hmm. guys you have working with you tonight? Uh, this, this truck has uh, five people uh, that work in it, and then the, the two announcers with each game. Uh, truck one has six. Uh, and the two announcers. The multi-cam units are just two guys that uh, uh, like each other. And uh, um, <laughs> at the beginning of the year, they like each other. By the end of the year, we won't say. Uh, but then Sports Report, yeah, there's uh, six highlight shooters with that. There's a, a six-person uh, crew running that show. And then we've got uh, two or three people running the scores room uh, for that. So, yeah, all of our announcers and independent contractors and part-timers combined, uh, there are are 50 to 55 uh, people uh, working each season. Uh, the only full-time person is myself. Yeah. So. <laughs> All right. So, 
All right, so we've been through the fall. You know, you got you had your, survived, your football yes. and all those volleyball <laughs> and all those types of things. Now we're in basketball, swimming, ladies basketball, wrestling. Yep. Between now and then, you're going to get into baseball and softball, and you'll do track. track. How many yeah. events? So box derby. <laughs> that's right. I, I, I was a part of that last uh, June. All right. How many events in a, in a typical calendar mm-hmm. year do you guys do? A school year? It, it varies um, significantly, but you know, between 275 and 350 a, a year. Uh, last, or, or excuse me, this week was was one of our really busy weeks. I think we had. Um, 14 events this week. Uh, you know, during basketball season, you have some of those. 16 or 17 is, is kind of the maximum. Uh, and then they send me away to the uh, sanitarium for a few weeks to <laughs> get myself together again. But, uh, you know, yeah, it, it varies you know, between probably you know, 10 and, and, and 16 uh, during the spring sports. And, and, yeah, about a maximum of 350 for the year, which, yeah, you, know, you think 365 days a year. Yeah. That's, that's that's overachieving, that, maybe. That's, that's a bunch. All right, one final question, okay. Ben, for those of us who, uh, you know, are always curious about jobs and young people and careers, your educational background that got you to here? Well, I, I started in high school uh, running. Uh, the, the one teacher thought I had good opinions, uh, and so she asked me to do my own opinion segment. Uh, they called it As Ben Sees It. Uh, please don't ever YouTube video clips of that um, ever. But um, that's that's how I started, and then I learned editing. Uh, yeah, working with that, and, and eventually um, kind of took over the the TV station in, in my high school. Went to college and uh, was yeah majoring in political science. And and they said, hey, we're going to start a TV station up on campus. I thought, oh, well, that could be fun. And so I started and and worked teleprompter um, for that, and and slowly worked my way up. And by my senior year, I was executive producer of, of that station. Uh, and towards the end of my senior year, I thought, you know, maybe politics is the hobby <laughs> and television is, is more the career path. And so, um, yeah, I pursued that. And, and um, thankfully, television is one of those you know, deals where you don't have to have majored in it. You can, yeah, you know, as long as you know what you're doing. And uh, thankfully, I had lots of experience. And so uh, that's where we ended up. And, and that's the really neat thing about WSN is it's such a good environment for people to learn. Yeah, you, know, you Frequently, I hire uh, students. You know that are. I've got several 16-year-olds right now working. They have no experience at any job at all, um, especially in television. Uh, this is a great place to, to start. And you know, it's a. We've got some great success stories. I remember. You know, Carl Lawson uh, left this specific truck and uh, worked. Uh, went to work on a Mark Wahlberg picture. Um, mm-hmm. Tyler Burnett. You know, somebody here locally uh, now works for uh, MRN Racing Network. Uh, so we, we've got a lot of people that have gone on to do some some really great things, yep. and uh, you know I'm I'm awful proud of that, and, and hopefully you know we've played a small part in equipping them and, and um, educating them and uh, you know propelling them towards that future. Well, you left off the major number one uh, job requirement. That is, you were the Xavier D'Artagnan <laughs> mascot when you were down at Xavier University and you did a great job. I, I was. I will not demonstrate those dance moves, <laughs> um, but that was that was one of those fun things that uh, that I got to do and. Uh, some great memories, some great pictures, and uh, yeah, something that uh, no matter what I do doesn't leave me behind. So, <laughs> all right. Well, we appreciate Ben Rife being on with us today here on a closer look. Ben, we appreciate all you do yeah. at the station, all the games it's, you get really on. It's my pleasure. It's a great event. We are always <laughs> glad to be part of it. Mark, I'll be back in a moment with the plays of the week. Right after this, you're watching a closer look on WOSN. Welcome back. We are at the big screen for Plays of the Week, and we're going to start at the Fieldhouse and take a look at something Wapak did. Well, this is a little bit of coaching things that we've got here. This is Doug Davis and Wapak, and they're ahead right now, and they want to make sure they get the ball in the hands of Aaron Gooding to make him sure he can shoot free throws. So what they're going to do, Shank takes the ball out of bounds, and they run two guys sideways, and they bring him right to the ball. Notice he doesn't panic and just throw it. He's going to accept the fouls because he knows he's a good free throw shooter. The two guys make their break. He comes right to the basketball, waits and waits and waits and draws contact. And now he gets to go to the free throw. And this time they triple screen for him and bring good this way. And right there he draws contact again. Notice he's got those arms out big, protecting the basketball. Here he comes again. One, two, three screens. So they got two different ways to get the ball inbounds to him. And he secures the basketball, then goes and makes a couple of free throws. And then we talked about a little while ago about uh, Jay Kaufman and about how he is back. Well, watch how fundamentally sound he is in the low post. This is Jay right here. He's going to come down in here and he's going to post up right here. 
And when he does that, he's going to be really big and catch the ball strong and go right up strong through traffic and score through traffic. He's going to do it twice, once on a move from this block, once from a move down in the middle part of the key, and we can kind of get this rolling. Watch him post up big, holds off without pushing off, and goes up and scores right there. He's going to look at that same move over again. And right here, post up big without shoving off with your arm, and then go strong through the contact right there. The next one, he actually pivots, and watch which leg he pivots off of, Mark. This leg right here, that's his right leg with a knee brace on. He goes up strong through traffic, scores, and draws contact right there. Here he is again, post up in the lane, big move, big body, go up strong through contact, and then make the free throw. And watch how fast right here, that this uh, right here is, watch him go, watch B.J. Miller go. He just went 94 feet on a basketball <laughs> floor with a ball faster than all the defenders could get back. Mark, you talk about guys who are fast and the guys who are basketball fast. He is the last guy on the baseline and he will beat every single player that a goal runs right by all five OG players, scores and gets fouled. That's speed with the ball. And then because Miller is so hot, we're going to show you a little bit of defense here. This is Schrader out chasing Miller around. The other four guys are playing zone. This is White, Kaufman, uh, Diebel, and the Heagle over here. And the focus is do not let him touch the basketball. And there you can see they throw the ball away trying to get it to him. And then when he does get it, let's make sure we get him some help. Here comes a screen by Cologne. So Heagle jumps out and plays him. Don't let Miller get a shot. It's a really good job. You see an open shot in the corner. You got to give something up. They rebound the basketball. A really good job running boxing one defense by the OG Titans. All right, Coach Shine. Good job. Always fun to look, get a little insight and take a look at it afterwards. You know, we go to the games. We just watch the action up and down the floor, and you think good shot, good yeah. rebound. There's a lot going on behind the scenes lot. that coaches are working on all day long. Thanks for pointing that out. All right, we got one more segment. We'll come back and finish up over at the desk. Hey, our final segment is to preview upcoming games, and I've got the first one, Ottawa Glandorf. They stand at 14-0, 4-0 in the WBL. They play at Shawnee. Shawnee is 11-3, 2-1, so they cannot have another loss. OG beat Salina in Lima Senior High last weekend. They have no missing parts to that team. We can attest to that. Shawnee lost to Van Wert, but beat uh, Wayne Trace when Johnny Capella threw in 40, like Mark mentioned a little while ago. Here's the key. For this game, they must find inside defense to stop Kaufman and Diebel because OG is strong inside with good perimeter players as well. Versailles has got an interesting weekend coming up. They have a MAC game on Friday night at Minster and then a non-conference game with Rushi on Saturday night. Versailles is 13-1. They average 63.2 points per game and they give up 46.2. That's a 17-point differential for the Versailles Tigers this year. We've already talked about Orange a couple of times. We've talked about his brother, AJ. Keaton McEldowney, he was our FCA Athlete of the Week. You told me he can really play, and I've noticed that on TV as well. Minster comes in at 8-3. and three. They are 3-0, and oh, also undefeated in conference play. They average 59.1. They give up 51.5. The key for them in their three losses, Minster has given up 61.3 points per game. In their, six, in their eight wins, they give up just 47.8. So defense is the key for them. Uh, Rushi, on the other hand, they're 6-1, 8-4. and, eight and four. This is a trap game for Versailles because Rushi does not play on Friday night. They'll be sitting there in the wings waiting. They average 50 points a game and give up 44. And Rushi, two good games for Versailles this weekend. On Saturday night, Wapakoneta plays at St. Henry. After they get their league games on Friday, they'll match up, and this could be a really good one too. Wapak, currently after a loss last night, um, they are 10-4. St. Henry is 11-2. Wapak beat Elida last week. Aaron Good and Adam Scott had really nice games. And then last night, a loss to Marion Local in overtime by just two points. St. Henry beat New Knoxville 69-37 and Ansonia 60-40. So they had two pretty easy wins. In that Ansonia game, they had five players between 9 and 11 points. How's that for That's sharing great scoring, balance. huh? Yep. Wapak's Gage Schenk, I think, is going to have to guard Tyler Schlarman. Or maybe Ryan Lutmer, but he's going <laughs> to key up on somebody really good. Should be a great Saturday night ball game. Interesting weekend for Lima Senior as well. They have a road or two league games this weekend. One on the road with Toledo St. Francis, the other a home game with Finley. 
The Spartans are 6-7. and seven. Of course, they have that Lima Cup on Tuesday night, if you haven't seen our episode of that yet. And I believe this is the first time that both LCC and Lima Senior come in without a, a winning record. In Usually one of them has a really good record, and usually both of them do. The Spartans are 1-4 in, in games decided by two points or less, part of it because of inconsistency. Miller has 9 on Friday, has 27 on Saturday. King has 21 on Friday and 6 on Saturday. It's been kind of that type of season for the Spartans. They did play very, very well against OG, and they could well be coming along. St. Francis is 11-3, 5-2 in the track. They defeated Lima Sr. by 1 back in the early part of the season. Then Lima Sr. has Finley on Saturday night. You say, wait a minute, you guys previewed that game. Yes, we did. That was snowed <laughs> out on January 12th. Finley is currently 7-5, uh, 2-3 and two and three in the conference, and they are at Whitmer on Friday night. Let's go to the Blanchard Valley Conference for a battle for first place. Van Buren, 8-5, 5-0 and five, five and oh in the league at Hopewell Loudon, 9-4, and 4-1 four, four and one in the league. Van Buren lost to LCC last Friday night, 47-43, and they have players that are averaging. Matthew Ayers averages 17.8 points a game. He has 25 threes. Cade Stevenson averages 10 points and 7 rebounds. Hopewell Loudon, they beat Corey Rosson last week 56-46, and their top players are Jordan Jury. He averages 15 and 5 assists. Luke Bolte, 10 points and 7 rebounds. Travis Milligan, 10 points and has 26 threes. So they got some firepower. These teams are trying to keep step with PG. They are 5-0, and and on February the 2nd, Pandora Gilboa, Van Buren could decide it all. All right, let's put up the other games that we've got. And we've got a bunch of them coming your way. Look there, about three lines down. Number one, Minster versus number one, Versailles. That's because they're in two different divisions. Girls basketball, that'll be a great one, along with Marion Local, Fort Recovery, LCC, Crestview. And then on Saturday, there's uh, that St. Henry Coldwater game. We go up north, the swimming championships, and there's that versailles Grushy game that Mark talked about a minute ago. Sunday even, a couple more games coming at you. Minster and Anna girls, St. Henry and Wapak that Mark and I will do. Great games coming at you every day. Stay with us all the way to Columbus. This has been another installment of A Closer Look. Thanks for joining us.